And now I'd just like to jump into a, uh, a talk about a topic that I think is very important to our further understanding of Parkinson's disease and in developing uh, new treatments for it. So I'm going to begin by uh, providing a few remarks about Parkinson's disease and what we understand about it so that a discussion of biomarkers will be uh, more meaningful for you. And then try to define what a biomarker is, uh, and then to describe uh, some of the ongoing efforts to um, develop strong and important and useful biomarkers for Parkinson's disease. But first, I'd like to digress to Yellowstone National Park, where uh, I went on uh, vacation with my family this year. and. Um, my wife and I uh, wanted to leave cares and woes about science behind us and um, just enjoy the scenery. And uh, rather quickly, our children um, interrupted to say that there's a lot going on here. We want to understand why things are changing behind us as we look on to the scenery. And, um, and we felt fairly overwhelmed to try to explain what was going on here and what underlay the process of geyser uh, eruption. But back to Parkinson's disease. It's a condition that um, we, we currently rely on the recognition of clinical signs of tremor and slowness, um, some postural changes to diagnose. These movement phenomena typically occur years after the disease process has started. And research estimates by the time any movement disorder has been appreciated by family members or doctors, that up to 50% of the dopamine releasing neurons um, that are involved in Parkinson's disease have already been lost. And of the remaining cells that are left that are still releasing dopamine and are alive, uh, many of them have these protein deposits um, that are called Lewy bodies to, by pathologists. And um, this uh, movie is a, is a cartoon of, um, of what's going on in Parkinson's disease. And what's meant to be shown here is um, that in a normal person on the right, on the, sorry, on the left side of the screen, uh, one observes um, a normal, what we would call normal brainstem area with the substantia nigra shown in these sort of black dots here at the base. And in someone with Parkinson's disease, um, there are fewer black dots because a number of the cells have been lost. Now, dopamine-releasing neurons project up to the brain to an area called the basal ganglia. And uh, these parts are called the striatum and the caudate. And these, these areas of the brain are involved in the coordination and modulation of movement. With the loss of the dopamine-releasing neurons that occurs in Parkinson's disease, there's less, there are fewer fibers going up to this area, and there is a con consequently a lower um, release of dopamine. And as, we, as many of you know, um, it's been found that the replacement of, of dopamine with either a precursor, levodopa, or dopamine agonists uh, can substantially improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now, we, in other talks, other formats, have talked about risk factors for Parkinson's disease. And we know that there are certain environmental factors, such as pesticides uh, and certain genetic backgrounds, um, that seem to increase the risk for Parkinson's disease. But we do not yet have a good understanding of the early biochemical changes that occur in Parkinson's disease and begin the, this process of protein accumulation um, that ends up causing neuronal death and Lewy body formation. And so a really major uh, goal of research is to uh, find a treatment that interferes with the early process of protein accumulation. Uh, and perhaps then will this um, finding such a um, Finding such a treatment will slow or uh, stop the progression of Parkinson's disease. 
And moreover, it's very likely that if we were to find such a, a treatment, that the earliest use of this treatment um, would have the best impact or the most important impact on, pe on people. So I'm going to take you back in time to 1997 when um, there was a fairly substantial discovery that in, uh, of a family that had a mutation in a certain gene called alpha-synuclein. And um, it was soon found that other mu point mutations and even a normal, normal gene expression but at higher levels could cause Parkinson's disease. The, the gene codes for a protein that seems to be located in an um, interesting place. It's the, the, the protein is located in the release areas where, um, where neurotransmitters are released a so-called presynaptic protein. And then a really Im incredible discovery was that this same protein that can cause Parkinson's disease turned out to be one of the prominent uh, proteins found in Lewy bodies. So not only was there the, the appreciation that mutations or overexpressions of this protein uh, are associated with the development of Parkinson's disease, but also that that protein was a major component of the protein accumulation that's seen in Parkinson's disease. And here's a third uh, important discovery, fairly recent, about eight years ago, by Heiko Brack and others. He looked for the, um, the deposit of synuclein in patients uh, with Parkinson's disease and also in people who died of other causes. And he was able to see in people who died of other causes with no symptoms of Parkinson's disease, in a small fraction, he found evidence of synuclein deposits in the lower brain stem and in the middle brain stem, sorry, in the middle brain stem here, and also in the autonomic plexus, or areas of the peripheral nervous system involved in autonomic um, support like the gut, like the heart. But in people with Parkinson's disease, he also found evidence of accumulation in the, what we call the midbrain, which you saw in the earlier pictures, up here. And in people who had cognitive dysfunction in addition to Parkinson's disease, there was evidence of accumulation in the cortex, where thinking occurs. So he put down the hypothesis that Parkinson's disease is a condition of protein aggregation with synuclein, and that it begins not in the brainstem, the midbrain where we talked about the substantia nigra being affected, but even below that, in the lower brainstem, in the autonomic areas of the, um, of the nervous system, and then there is a gradual involvement of upper brainstem areas, and only once those areas are involved do the symptoms of Parkinson's disease occur. On to biomarkers. So a biomarker, the idea of a biomarker is that it's an objective test that aids in the detection of, of a disease. It may provide information regarding the extent or the progression of the disease as well. And any test that we do in medicine or in other areas has limitations. Some tests can be very specific. They find everyone, everyone who has a positive test has that disease, but it might miss people who are early in the disease or for whatever reason aren't detected by that test. Other tests um, may um, be very sensitive. They find every single person who has that disease but they may find other people who have unrelated conditions. Um, and so when we're looking for biomarkers, we want a biomarker with a great deal of specificity and sensitivity. And so this is um, a problem as we look for um, biomarkers. And this takes us back, interestingly, to um, Yellowstone. What my children were were struggling for was a deeper understanding of geyser formation. 
like we're looking for biomarkers, they wanted to know a deeper meaning to the geysers, and they felt that they needed, they deserved explanations regarding um, uh, geophysics and uh, geology that my wife and I weren't able uh, to provide. Many of you are, are actually quite comfortable with the idea of biomarkers. You've heard of prostate-specific antigen, which is a blood test that can be used in detection of, um, of prostate um, cancers. Um, you're also familiar with mammography, uh, useful in, the, in screening for breast cancer, and colonoscopy. In the neurodegenerative world, uh, amyloid imaging has been developed for, um, for Alzheimer's disease. A special um, ligand or tracer that can be uh, used in brain imaging to show areas where there is this accumulation of amyloid uh, in patients who are having cognitive issues. And more recently, um, it's been found that spinal fluid markers are also useful in um, the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. And interestingly, although there is an accumulation of amyloid in patients' brains with Alzheimer's disease, the finding is of a lower level of um, beta amyloid in the spinal, spinal fluid of patients. So what, are, what kind of biomarkers are we looking at in Parkinson's disease? And um, I think many of us have, have looked carefully for what we call clinical biomarkers, or ones that are, um, can be observed or described by patients uh, in the clinic. And a um, well-described uh, one is of olfactory dysfunction. And it's, very, um, it's been described in many different series that a loss of sense of smell is often observed in the years prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Sleep disturbances have also been described, um, such as um, active dreaming, um, which may occur years before the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Constipation um, is also um, oftentimes described. And cardiac changes in cardiac functions that, that can be observed with imaging um, have also been described. Unfortunately, these clinical features are not ideal markers because they don't occur in every person destined to develop Parkinson's disease, um, and um, they may not occur for, uh, at all in some patients. You're probably also familiar with imaging biomarkers. It's well known that conventional MRI is not useful for making a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. We use imaging to exclude other conditions that might be causing the features of Parkinson's disease. But over the years, a number of agents have been uh, developed that rely on the changes of dopamine neurotransmission. And the, the longest established one is fluoridopa. And what it does is it gives us information regarding the storage of dopamine in Parkinson's disease patients or people who, have, um, who are thought to have Parkinsonism. And a more recent example of this um, looks at the dopamine transporter. These are the so-called DAT scans. Here's an example of uh, a fluoridopa scan in a normal person. And what you see is in the area of the st uh, striatum that I showed you in a cartoon form before, there is a robust uptake of the fluoridopa shown in orange. The cooler areas on the outside don't have, a, have much uptake in a normal person. In Parkinson's disease, that robust uptake that we see in the normal person is not seen as well in the, um, in the striatum. And this is because of the loss of the dopamine-releasing terminals. Thus far, we have not been able to find a, bio, a imaging marker, um, as has been found in Alzheimer's disease for amyloid, for synuclein. It is an area of intense um, interest, though. Other modalities have also been looked at, and it's, um, I think it's been with some surprise that uh, it's been found that transcranial sonography or ultrasound can be used to image the brainstem 
and uh, has found abnormalities in up to 90% of patients who develop Parkinson's disease. But the size of this imaging abnormality seen in ultrasound is, um, is, doesn't correlate with the d disease severity and doesn't give us any sense of progression. You can't use it to grade Parkinsonism, um, and it, um, it, it is not, does not appear to be a dynamic marker. So the imaging markers that we've developed um, have limitations, and probably the key one is that all those that look at dopamine are, are looking at the disease well after it's established itself. If you recall that I said half the, the dopaminergic um, neurons have been lost um, um, before the symptoms develop. So what, I, what other areas might there be to look for um, biomarkers? Well, in other conferences and um, from your experience um, in, in learning about Parkinson's disease, you know there are genetic risk factors for Parkinson's disease. And the most common um, sporadic um, dominant cause is the LRRK2 uh, mutation, which accounts for about 1 to 2 percent of sporadic cases, but in, um, in familial cases up to 10 percent. So it's not that uncommon. A inherent problem with this is that even if you carry the gene at what age or if you ever will develop Parkinson's disease is not certain. So you can't use this to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. There are other risk factors such as the glucose reversidase mutation, um, which can occur in up to 20 percent of Ashkenazi Jews. On the other hand, penetrance here is also limited. They're recessive genes, and these can be tested for genetically, too. But because the onset um, is slow and progressive, these t tests don't provide a way of diagnosing the ongoing pathologic process of Parkinson's disease. So we think of genetic testing as good for diagnosing a trait or a susceptibility for Parkinson's disease but we don't think about genetic testing as being a way of telling us where a person is with Parkinson's disease or whether even it's begun. Because in an, a person who has the LLRK2 gene, it's unlikely at age 20 or 15 that they have an ongoing process. We don't think so yet. So we think of it as a state marker, the susceptibility that that, that person has, as opposed to a state or a level of activity of the condition of Parkinson's disease uh, in any given person. So again, what we're seeking in biomarkers is a, a sense of the actual ongoing process of the disease. Um, and going back to alpha-synuclein, we've already said that it's a major protein of Lewy bodies. Its accumulation precedes the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And it accumulates in, a, in lower neural structures first, including the autonomic nerves and the lower brainstem before the brain. And this has led people to look at biologic tissues as associated with the gut. And because we do routine um, biopsies of colon for people who undergo routine colonoscopy, this provides a possible window or biomarker assay for early Parkinson's disease. So one study of 10 control patients and 29 uh, Parkinson's disease patients found evidence of alpha-synuclein inclusions in 21 of 29 patients. And a more recent study um, looked at um, patients who'd never been treated for Parkinson's disease. Um, and were just initially diagnosed. And in that study, nine of 10 patients had alpha-synuclein inclusions and none of the controls. And so this provides uh, hope that a accessible area of the body, um, the colon, might be a way of making an early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and perhaps getting a sense um, um, uh, a sense of the activity of the condition 
but that remains to be proven. And we're in uh, collaboration with um, the Nussbaum Lab here at UCSF uh, to look at this in more detail. This slide uh, shows um, the, it's from colon biopsy, and what you see here is the, the, the frilly areas of the colon here, and then the, the wall, the actual wall of the colon. And the areas that stain, just a moment here, the areas that stain dark here are those areas that are rich in synuclein in patients with Parkinson's disease. The images on the left are at lower power, and the images on the right are at higher power, and they, they um, conform to shapes of neurons. Um, and so we, we know that this, that this uh, technique, um, or we, we feel that this technique may be useful. Now, colonoscopy is not without risk. There's a risk of bowel perforation, so we're, we're looking for even safer ways of, um, of, of obtaining biomarkers. A great deal of research over the last 20 years has found that oxidative stress seems to be increased in people with Parkinson's disease, and so we're looking for markers, whether of blood, of spinal fluid, or brain imaging that might be useful in um, making an early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But so far, no marker has been identified. It's also um, been found that uh, inflammatory pathways uh, seem to be involved, but so far, no biomarkers have been identified that are specific for Parkinson's disease. So we've, we've um, looked at and followed hypothesis-driven um, science quite a ways in Parkinson's disease, and now we're exploring areas that are unbiased. We're, we're, with the development of techniques that can assay many different proteins, many different genes, um, uh, and small molecules, with the advent of those scientific techniques, we're able to do things called sc screening for biomarkers uh, in an unbiased way. And this is a really exciting time for science in general, and biology in particular. And so some people call it omics because, it, because what you're looking at is genes, proteins, transcription, and metabolic markers, or all these ending in omics in, in an unbiased way. Many of you have, might have heard about a, an, initi an initiative by the Michael J. Fox Foundation and others looking for um, biomarkers, and that's, it's called the, micro, sorry, it's called the Parkinson's Progressive Progression Markers Initiative, or PPMI, and they're, they're looking for about 400 people who are newly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and not taking any medications for Parkinson's disease. Uh, who are willing to be followed over three to five years. And their goal is to identify markers of Parkinson's disease in these early patients um, by assaying spinal fluid, doing brain imaging, looking at um, blood markers and DNA markers. And uh, this, this um, initiative is, is ongoing uh, and is occurring at many sites uh, in the United States. It is only, only open right now to people with, er, with early Parkinson's disease with no, on no medications. Here at UCSF, we've um, partnered with a small company, uh, also supported by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, that's looking for perhaps more, more um, dynamic markers of Parkinson's disease. And we're using it, there's a, this company uses a novel technique to trace the production and the expression and transport of proteins uh, and other molecules in Parkinson's disease patients and controls. In the past nine months, uh, 12 people, um, some in this room today, have enrolled in this study um, and had blood and spinal fluid markers um, 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 obtained and studied already. And the early analysis of these uh, spinal fluid markers shows defects in transport 
um, of neuronal proteins uh, compared to control subjects. So, so already, um, this uh, small project is, is showing some uh, useful information and is being followed up with, with a, a further study. So to recap, the, the idea is to, the ideal biomarker will identify a patient who is beginning to undergo metabolic changes associated with Parkinson's disease, but before substantial injury has occurred, it may allow for a measure of disease activity or progression that may be useful to track the benefit of medications um, or neuroprotective therapies. And in the end, some combination of markers may be necessary. There might be one marker for detection and there might be another marker for, um, that gives us a better sense of disease activity. To conclude, Parkinson's disease begins years before the diagnosis in regions that do not affect dopamine-releasing neurons. Early metabolic changes associated with the beginning of Parkinson's disease may be useful biomarkers, but we don't know what they are yet. Beyond confirming the diagnosis, biomarkers may allow for presymptomatic pre diagnosis that allows earlier treatment. But beyond that, the discovery of these biomarkers may provide crucial information about the neurodegenerative process in Parkinson's disease that might inspire us to new therapies. And with that, I close.